i korke har jeg ikke kigt sig i dagvagt og aarses kan i dagget i min kuset i skøv. Den tjem namasot, kita ajagona masot, og tau aarse messa kan i dagget. Jeg kunne da også, jeg kunne han hætte maske med på tårsen, så ah, hvor nævko. My mother struggled with addictions um, her entire life, having been raised in the child welfare system. I think that's what led to the unstableness in her life and having addictions to both alcohol and drugs. I remember growing up, my parents. Um, would drink a lot. Sometimes they would like barricade the hallway so that we wouldn't be able to get out while they were having a party or something. I was in and out of foster care growing up because uh, you know problems happened. My dad was a wonderful man, don't get me wrong, but like he was an alcoholic. Uh, he drank lots and he'd like sometimes beat my stepmom in front of me, my older brother. When you grow up with like your mom partying and whatnot and your dad like that, you just tend to try to forget the bad things in it. And so I can, I try to block that all out and just remember the good times I had. Well, I think it's time for us to take a serious look at what we provide for services to, to First Nations and Métis children and their families when it comes to child welfare. The separation from our mother was really really difficult because um, we had a lot of pain thinking that we were abandoned or we were unwanted. It was difficult to understand as a child why you couldn't be with your family. The first time I was brought into care I was like five. Being taken away from your home and everything feels terrible. Like that's all you ever knew and everything and now you're being like transported to an alien country, like something very foreign. Those kind of memories are very traumatic, so they stay with you longer. Once you remove a child from their, from their natural environment, it's very traumatizing for them because now they're, they're looking at shifting their whole lifestyle and to try and adapt to a new way of life. And for uh, various reasons, it's, it's very difficult for them to do that. Getting separated from my siblings. Uh, when I got first got in, taken into care, I wanted to be with them. I really did. I didn't want to leave them. Because, you know, I was the older brother, and it's kind of my responsibility to watch over them. But I wasn't really given the chance or choice. So getting separated from them was, like, really scary. It wasn't fun. It was like, I really thought I'd never get to see them again, which was scary. <laughs> well, I think when children come into care, uh, they have to maintain contact with their family. Uh, there has to be someone that they can talk to, someone that can maybe visit them, whether it's a, a grandmother or a grandfather or an aunt or an uncle. It was hard being away from my family. When I was first in care, I didn't talk to any of my family for about a month and a half. And just, you know, being basically cut off from them. It was hard. When I was 16, I realized I had rights to visit my family. I discovered through a book uh, that told me all my rights as a foster child. It just made me very upset with the system, my social workers, because there were many, and my foster mother, because I felt like as a foster child, when you have family, you should be able to connect. That's time with my family that that I could have had, that I could have had those connections with growing up. To me, it is uh, really important to uh, stay connected. The other important thing is uh, identity. Those little children need to be uh, proud. They need to be proud. They have to have that sense of something in there. The impacts of residential school, for instance, there's uh, very few positives. And it's like a, a cancer, a disease. It's like for 100 years of damage, it takes about another 100 years to really treat something that's really untreatable or takes a long time. It's difficult to stop the intergenerational cycle that is continuing to this day from colonization to residential schools and 
the child welfare system is just a modern day residential school. The secure unit that I was in, um, you couldn't even like step outside. It was doors were locked all the time. You had to ask to go and use the bathroom. The only time you'd be let outside, it would be in a fenced area and there would be one or two staff with you at all times. These children are so locked in. They're, they don't have that freedom to live a, like a child, like a healthy child. There's a the fear that if you're a foster kid, you cannot make friends with children who are not in care. They are not allowed to go and stay at their friend's house or go somewhere unless the whole family has criminal check. The child welfare system uh, can keep children physically safe. The, the problem is we can, we can pay attention to the physical safety of a child and, and disregard the mental and the emotional and the spiritual safety of that child just by what we do to create physical safety. And physical safety is critically important. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to negate that. But if we don't pay attention to those other things, we're harming a child too. I have three girls and two boys um, from 10 to 17. The mother of my children, we were together at the time when they were taken um, uh, due to addictions and, and say, extracurricular activities. While the kids were in care, they had uh, divulged a little bit of information about uh, the treatment that they were going through and uh, it, it kind of scared me. You know, I, I actually had uh, uh, been placed in different homes twice um, due to uh, drug use, uh, due to uh, violence, um, physical violence. Um, you know, do they even know where they're putting our children? I mean, it, they're designed to help families and yet they would put kids in danger uh, unknowingly, but I mean, they're doing the same thing. You know, if, if anything, they made things a little bit worse. The purpose of child welfare is to make sure the child is safe. And that's what they did for me and my brothers and sisters. But there should also be efforts to keep the children within the community rather than completely removing the child from the community, the culture, their family. I think for any child who's been, you know, taken off the reserve and away from their family to be put into a foster home or group home in a city or something like that, I know it's hard on them. They're just alone and afraid, you know, and it's not right. We often hear about how we want to make the, uh, the necessary changes, uh, how we want to change policy. Uh, how we want to make that difference in the lives of our young people and children. But sometimes we fail to realize that uh, we have to ask them what they want, how they want to live. I've seen miracles happen with proper mentoring and understanding and making someone feel like self-worth. That's what I would want for these kids. I have a great relationship with my kids you now. Um, now that they're in a stable environment, you know, after so long, um, their future looks promising. Um, there's a lot of work to do. Um, it's apparent uh, how uh, damaged I guess they are, but I'm hopeful. You know? I've got a good support network now and uh, we're getting them the help that they need. The cool thing is that uh, it's time they know that I'm going to be there when it's over. I want to see strong Aboriginal involvement. Uh, uh, the way it's been for the last 20 years, if you go back 20 years when they were talking about the redesign of children's services to be built on the four pillars, one of the pillars was Aboriginal involvement. And uh, it didn't take long for that pillar to crumble. And over the last 15 years or so, we've sort of been tolerated, humored, ignored, but we were never given uh, full involvement into looking after our children and making decisions on our, our children. If I could change one thing, it'd have to be keep the kids together, honestly. Like, we were, sure we were a big family, there was like seven of us, but like, I really want to be with my, my little brothers and sisters and be the big brother I was supposed to be. Getting separated from them is really lonely. 
not for me, but also probably for them. And it can cause a lot of problems later in life because I didn't really know how to act when I saw them again. Listen to them. Their voice matters. Only they know what they're feeling, right? They might not be able to express that in words, but if you listen, you'll hear it. Government doesn't create change. Government reacts to change. And change is created by communities who say enough, who say we've had more than enough. It's time to make a difference now, and we demand change, and then governments will take action. This is not an Aboriginal people's issue. This is a Canadian issue. This is an Alberta's issue. Um, and, and it really is our issue because these are our friends and our neighbours and our community members and they're people that if, if we stay connected to each other we can make a positive difference collectively. The time is now uh, to come to a table without the preconceived notions about what will work for, for uh, these children and families and to hear what they have to say and to pay attention to it and to make the changes. Um, that are needed.